century and a half ago, the American iron industry was born here, which made Catasauqua both rich and well-known. Famous visitors like President Grant, Thomas Edison, Buffalo Bill Cody, and St. John Newman came to Catasauqua. And so did thousands of ordinary people, immigrants from all over Europe. They came in search of their share of the American dream, and many found it here on the banks of the Lehigh. and factories where they worked are gone, those immigrants' names are still here. Many Catasauquins are their descendants. The land on which the borough stands was part of a tract of 10,000 acres deeded by William Penn's daughter Letitia to John Page in 1731. The estate was known as Shawton or Sheroton Manor, and the price of the land was one red rose. The earliest settlers here were Irish, but they began to be succeeded by German farmers in the mid-1700s. places here, and roads, marked in red on this map, connected the then unnamed settlement to Bethlehem, Shanersville, and Allentown. The oldest house still standing in Catasauqua is on Ray Street between Front and Second. It was built around 1760. About the same time, the Kurtz family began farming along the Catasauqua Creek, although this house of theirs, which still stands on Wood Street, was built around 1805. The Kurtzes were joined in 1768 by a distinguished, though part-time, neighbor, George Taylor. Taylor was a successful iron maker and a justice of the peace of Northampton County, which then also included the present Lehigh County. Taylor built a fine stone house set on a 300-acre farm. His house in Catasauqua is the only home of a signer of the Declaration of Independence, which still stands in Pennsylvania. After Taylor's death, the house passed to Colonel David Deschler, and in 1821 was purchased by Jacob Diley. The Faust family built this house, later torn down to make room for the Bride and Horseshoe Works, at another ford at the foot of Arch Street. The Beery family bought the grist mill at the mouth of Catasauqua Creek at the beginning of the 19th century. Near a ford in the Lehigh, Frederick Beery built three stone houses which still stand on Ray Street. When his son Solomon converted one into an inn, the settlement became known as Beery's Port. In 1824, the ford was spanned by a chain bridge, and the little cluster of houses became Beery's Bridge. Catasauqua might have remained a small country village, but for these two men, Josiah White and Erskine Hazard. In 1818, these Quaker businessmen from Philadelphia formed the Lehigh Navigation Company for the purpose of building a canal. It took two years to raise the capital for this endeavor, and construction of the Lehigh Coal and Navigation Canal was not begun until 1825. When it was completed in 1828, the canal reached from Easton to Ma Chunk, and boats carrying coal and grain passed through Beery's Port. But White and Erskine soon realized that the greatest value of coal was in industrial uses, especially the making of iron. They learned of experiments in Britain using anthracite coal in iron making, and in 1838, Hazard traveled to Yinniskedwin, Wales, where a 44-year-old iron master named David Thomas had perfected the science of smelting iron with anthracite coal. Hazard and Thomas's wife Elizabeth persuaded him to uproot his family and come to Pennsylvania. On July 11, 1839, David Thomas and his son Samuel arrived on foot in Beery's Bridge. The tiny hamlet was selected for Thomas's great experiment because the canal dropped about eight feet here, setting up a current that could power the new mill. Only a year later, on July 3, 1840, Thomas put into blast the first successful commercial anthracite iron furnace in America. You could compare this feat to a late 20th century person building a working space shuttle in their garage. Thomas brought no skilled workers with him, America was an industrial infant with no foundries that could build the massive tubes and furnaces he had worked with in Wales. Everything needed for this undertaking had to be imported or improvised. Thomas had only his genius and his persistence, but as a result of his hard work, the industrial age in America was born in Catasauqua. The Lehigh Crane Iron Company was named after George Crane, Thomas's former employer in Wales. <laughs> 
1956, when this print was made, the crane had five blast furnaces in operation. This picture is interesting in many ways. It shows the covered bridge the company built across the Lehigh in 1854, from which Bridge Street got its name. In those days, the street ran right down to the river. In the upper left is Thomas's second home in Catasauqua. What Thomas had achieved was the combination of the clean, hot burn of anthracite with heated air forced into the blast furnace. Though he wasn't the first person to recognize the benefits of the hot blast, Thomas developed a bigger, stronger furnace that could contain the united heat of the air and coal to produce pure, strong anthracite iron. In this sketch from an early 20th century book on iron making, we see men dumping ore and coal into the top of the blast furnace. When the iron was melted, it poured out of the bottom of the furnace onto the casting floor. There, the red-hot stream flowed into channels of wet sand. It was left to cool and harden into pigs, so called because the channels resembled piglets nursing at a sow. lifted out with tongs and by hand. As we can see here, protective clothing on the casting floor consisted of leather aprons and gloves. The workers wore wooden-soled shoes to protect their feet from the heat. It was hot, dirty, dangerous work, but it paid well enough to make Catasauqua grow from a few dozen farming folk in 1840 to a village of almost 2,000 in only 20 years. These pictures, taken in the 1940s, are of David Thomas's first home in Catasauqua at the corner of Front and Church Streets, where Cassie's now stands. In 1856, he built a new house at Second and Pine. The walls of this house are enclosed in the stone building which still stands there. A post office was established in 1844. It moved many times and early on was located here in the house that still stands at 110 Front Street. In 1854, Catasauqua was incorporated as a borough. The name was suggested by Owen Rice, chief clerk of the Crane Iron, who noted that 18th century deeds had named the creek by a Lenai Lenape Indian word variously translated as dry ground or once rain. The Catasauqua Creek was then the eastern and southern boundaries of the town. The growth and increasing prosperity demanded a bank. The Bank of Catasauqua was chartered in 1857. The following year, after refusing an offer by David Thomas of property at Second and Bridge, the bank opened at Front Street below Mulberry, where it remained until 1903. A newspaper, the Catasauqua Herald, was begun by Arnold Lewis in 1859. This picture, dated 1860, is the oldest photograph in our collection. The house with the windows in the rear still stands at Church and Railroad Streets, while the stable in between them was torn down after the Civil War to make way for Borough Hall. Lewis enlisted in the Union Army in 1861. So did nearly 200 other Catasauquans, a high percentage for a town numbering only a little over 1,900 people. Many Catasauqua boys saw action with the 47th Regiment in Louisiana and the Red River Expedition. In 1914, only 46 Catasauqua Civil War veterans were still alive. The last five posed on Memorial Day 1929 in front of the bank. Ironically, the second man from the right, William Glace, died exactly two weeks later. William Haynes, a retired lock keeper, is the man in the center. The man on the right is James Bidle. Unfortunately, we do not know the names of the other two. Their heroism is commemorated in this monument in Fairview Cemetery. Dedicated in 1866, it is the first Civil War memorial erected in Pennsylvania. The boys in blue returned home to a booming industrial town. These three maps, made in 1867, 1876, and 1886, show the expansion of Catasauqua. From a population of 1,932 in 1860, the town grew to 2,853 only 10 years later. The 1880 census showed an addition of only a bit over 200 people, but by 1890, Catasauqua had over 3,700 inhabitants. This was the golden age of iron, and Catasauqua made plenty of it. In 1868, the crane constructed a sixth furnace. 
Twelve years later, the original three furnaces were replaced, and in 1881, the crane produced over 100,000 tons of iron. By then, the crane was operating its own railroad as well. David Thomas's reputation as an iron maker had led to the formation of the Thomas Iron Works in 1854. His success in Catasauqua was one of the factors for locating it across the river in Hockendaqua. The Thomas was incredibly successful, yielding an over 500% return to its investors. Another measure of its success was that it paid over $200,000 in taxes on iron to the federal government in 1867. In 1914, its nine furnaces produced over 260,000 tons of iron. When he died in 1882, the immigrant Welsh genius affectionately known as Father Thomas was a very wealthy man. This flood of iron attracted other industries that could use it. A rolling mill for making boilerplate opened at Front and Walnut in the 1850s. In 1865, the Davies and Thomas foundry began on Ray Street. From this mill eventually came components for New York's Holland Tunnel. In 1882, the Bryden Horseshoe Works began business. It acquired an international reputation for the British War Department bought a train car load of Bryden Boss shoes every week during the Boer War. The same year, Wind's Lumberyard began providing building materials for houses which sprang up all over the borough. Success breeds success, and in the latter years of the 19th century, Catasauqua epitomized success. It had a large, efficient, and educated workforce, which attracted other industries. In 1890, silk making began in Catasauqua at the Juanita Silk Mill on the Canal Road. Here at last was safer, cleaner, and socially acceptable work for the town's women. Less to its credit, the silk business also employed a lot of children. The Juanita ran 700 looms. 150 more came with the founding of the Dairy Silk Mill in 1897. George Desiderius Dairy, a former soldier in the Imperial Austrian Army, made and lost a fortune from silk in America. We do not know when the Unicorn Ribbon Mill in North Catasauqua started operations, but it was destroyed and rebuilt after a disastrous fire in 1895. A grist mill had stood near the mouth of the creek since 1752. At one point it belonged to the Beery family. In 1898 it was destroyed in a fire. Turning disaster into opportunity, the owners, Frank Mauser and Alan Cressman, rebuilt with the latest technology and doubled their output. The flour they produced here pr reached markets all over the East Coast. By the 1870s, Catasauqua was well served by a transportation network of water and rail. The great age of the canals as the highways of America was nearly over when photography was invented, which is why we have no early pictures of the canal. But even after the coming of the railroads, the canal remained an excellent way of moving bulky goods like coal. This is George Diley's coal yard between race and union. A canal boat heading north had to pass through lock 36 alongside the crane. These pictures at that lock were made after 1906 because the Pine Street Bridge is visible in the background. boats were sometimes homes to the families of the men who worked them. Like most proud householders, canalmen sometimes decorated their boats. On through Catasauqua, under the Pine Street Bridge, and back onto the Lehigh at the Hockendaqua Lock. The Thomas Iron Works is seen in these pictures of Guard Lock 6, which was one of the locks that kept water flowing through the canal. This picture shows the wing dam and the wicket gate, which put water into the canal. 
the so-called dog houses in this picture, controlled the lower gates of the lock the boats used. Boats entered the lock from the river under this little footbridge. The ruins of this lock are still visible through the brush below the Hakandakwa Bridge. Even in its prime as a commercial waterway, the canal provided recreation as well. Here are two groups for whom the canal made a pleasant day on the water. But in this fine picture of the crane and the canal, we see the iron rails which eventually took the business of moving goods to and from Catasauqua away from the canal. first steamed and snorted its way to Catasauqua in 1855, when the tracks of the Lehigh Valley Railroad reached as far as the Crane Company's bridge over the Lehigh. In the fall of that year, a festive party got off, walked across the bridge, dined at the Eagle Hotel, and went off to inspect David Thomas's new furnace in Hakandakwa. That covered bridge fell in a flood in 1862 and was replaced by this bridge, which stood until 1904. Then it was replaced by an iron bridge that could hold heavier trains. The Lehigh Valley's earlier station is shown here, before the construction of the Iron Pine Street Bridge in 1906. The change from the trestle, which also allowed pedestrian and carriage traffic to one that only accommodated trains, left the mid part of town without a way over the river. In 1906, the Iron Pine Street Bridge remedied that situation. By 1908, when this photograph was made, two iron bridges carried trains and traffic across the river. The Lehigh Valley Railroad replaced its collection of buildings with a brick station. From here, many Catasauquins embarked on journeys on the Black Diamond, which ran through Catasauqua on its way from New York to Buffalo. Iron ore and limestone from the western part of Lehigh County to the furnaces of Catasauqua was very hard on the roads of the 1850s. In 1856, despite much opposition from the farmers in the Jordan Valley, James Fuller secured a charter for the Catasauqua and Foglesville Railroad. The Catasauqua and Foglesville's 1165-foot bridge over the Jordan was one of the longest iron spans of its time. The railroad also had a large rail yard below Fairview Cemetery. The Ironton Railroad began bringing ore and limestone to the furnaces in Catasauqua and Hakandakwa in 1859. Steaming up the east bank of the Lehigh in 1868, the Central Railroad of New Jersey connected Catasauqua with the ports of New York. This was its Catasauqua station. Hotel, built at Front and Bridge in 1850, offered Catasauqua's first real accommodations to her numerous visitors. Among the services it offered both traveler and townsmen was this well-appointed barbershop. The venerable American Hotel has stood at Front and Race since 1852. The Pennsylvania Hotel was built at Second and Bridge in 1855. The mansion house opened in the 1860s, and one of its early owners was returning Civil War veteran Henry Hart. It boasted this elegant bar room. The Catasauqua Brewery Hotel began trade on 2nd Street near Union in 1869. While the Union Hotel was built across the street at the Five Points in 1871. Hotel Fairmount, now the Mansard Inn, opened its doors on Ray Street at 11th in 1897. 
Farmer's Hotel was built in the 1860s and has been in the McCarty family for the better part of a century. Seen here draped in bunting for the old Home Week celebrations in 1914, the Farmer's Hotel was a frequent stopping place for candidates seeking political office. Apparently with good reason, for these pictures suggest that it was less of a lodging for well-heeled travelers than a local gathering place for the town's workers. swap gossip and catch up on the baseball scores. From the taps of all these hotels float excellent local beer. The German immigrants who came to Catasauqua brought both their taste for beer and ale and their great brewing skills. The Eagle Brewery was begun in 1867 by Hermann Kostenbader. In 1892, he brought the wonders of year-round ice to Catasauqua. In 1913, the Eagle produced over 13,000 barrels of beer. The Catasauqua Brewery also began in 1869. In 1906, Charles Leonard bought it and made soft drinks as well as beer. From its earliest days, Catasauqua was concerned with the education of its children. David Thomas brought a strong belief in schooling to Catasauqua. The Crane Iron Company built the first school in the 1840s on Church Street. The second was here at Union and Railroad Streets. And the third, built in 1854 on 2nd Street, gave the street alongside its name, School Street. The building remained a school until 1897. And it still stands on 2nd Street. A larger school opened at Front and Mulberry in 1868. Many of its pupils could see their future out of its windows, for it stood alongside the Crane Ironworks. As early as 1858, the town saw a need for a high school, so this building, the first high school in Lehigh County, was built at Second and Walnut. It provided a full four-year course of studies, and its first graduating class numbered two. Many townspeople remember this as the Second Street School. In 1869, the schools of Catasauqua enrolled 40 high school students and 674 grade schoolers. The date of the founding of the North Catasauqua School is unknown, but it was sometime in the 1890s. The Lincoln School was opened in 1897. Despite its 10 rooms, a high school population of over 100 soon crowded it. So in 1911, a new high school was built adjacent to the Lincoln. In 1914, it had 115 pupils, although the 1914 history of town notes that in fact a lower percentage of students went on to high school than had 20 years earlier, because there were more jobs open to them. However, this picture of the class of 1912 shows that about two dozen stayed with their studies. There were also two parochial grade schools at St. Mary's and St. Lawrence's. They were staffed by the Sisters of St. Francis. David Thomas and his family were devout Presbyterians. They founded the first Presbyterian church in 1839, the same year the Crane Ironworks began. The congregation outgrew this tiny wooden structure on Church Street and laid the cornerstone for the present church on Second Street in 1854. Catasauqua's new citizens brought their own customs, language, and ways of worship. The Scots-Irish founded an English-speaking Presbyterian church on Bridge Street in 1850. This stood as an independent congregation until the 1930s. German Catholics were numerous enough by 1857 to begin their own church, St. Mary's, founded by St. John Newman, the Bishop of Philadelphia. The church in these pictures was built in 1898. The convent school and rectory were all completed by 1909. John Newman also ministered to the Irish settlement and established St. Lawrence's in 1858. German Lutheran settlers established St. Paul's in 1857. 
church which became Salem UCC was begun in 1868. The Evangelical Church was built in 1859. In 1873, Trinity Lutheran Church was founded by a group, mostly younger members of St. Paul's, who wanted to worship in English. But ties to the old world remained, and in the 1880s, Mother Elizabeth Thomas established the Welsh Congregational Church at Forth and Pine. Trinity Lutheran built a new church on that site in 1924. In 1860, Grace Methodist was founded in the congregation's first building on Front Street, which later became the Odd Fellows Hall. On Christmas Day, 1890, they dedicated their present church on Fifth Street. St. John's Evangelical Church was established in 1898. Eastern European immigrants brought the Slovak language and the Orthodox religion to Catasauqua. Trinity, the sixth oldest Orthodox church in the United States, was built on 5th Street in 1897, while St. Andrew's, Slovak but Roman Catholic, began in 1903. Episcopalians, led by Crane President Leonard Peckett, built St. Stephen's in 1905. Alongside its spiritual life, Catasauqua developed a strong sense of civic pride. We can boast a long history of volunteer effort, epitomized to this day by the fire department. The Phoenix was chartered in 1869, after a fire at the Crane. The fire company shared its quarters with the first town hall, erected in 1867. This was Catasauqua's first piece of firefighting equipment, a pomper. Shortly afterward, the Southwark Fire Company was begun at Second and Church. It was named after a Philadelphia fire department from which it acquired its first equipment. The Sherouten Fire Company was begun in North Catasauqua in 1911 and the East End two years later. The Catasauqua Band was organized in 1873. For over 100 years, the band has provided music for many celebrations. Here is an early picture of the band in front of Kemp's livery stable on Bridge Street, where the news agency now stands. Many Catasauquans, including David Thomas, were pledged to one of the large social and civic movements of the 19th century, temperance. The school on Front Street became a temperance hall, which sponsored its own fife and drum corps. In the 1880s and 90s, Catasauquans were enthusiastic players and fans of baseball. A common summer entertainment was to root for the home team. While the park on the creek, which later became the playgrounds, provided gentler recreations as well. Civil War veteran Henry Hart formed a militia of young men. In the rear is Borough Hall. These street scenes are from the closing years of the 19th century. They differ from the way we see them today, but we can recognize the locations. This view is of 2nd Street below Wood. Only the middle part of the low building in the center remains, and the street was still unpaved. Here is the five points at 2nd, Union, and Howard Town, and front near Bridge, both covered in snow. Water, either the aftermath of a flood or spring runoff, flows across 10th Street near the site of Kurtz's farm. The bare hill in the background is currently the Catasauqua Woods. This picture of Front and Bridge Streets was taken sometime after 1893 because the streetcar tracks are visible, but before 1903 when the building in the front was replaced by the Lehigh Bank. One feature that would have been rather new to the people of that time are the electrical and telephone poles. Telephone and electric service reached Catasauqua in 1890. Also before 1893, a covered bridge crossed the canal at Ray Street, which was still dirt and without trolley tracks. Until that year, public transit consisted of horse-drawn cars. Passengers bound for Allentown had to walk across both bridges to make connections. In 1893, a new iron bridge brought electric cars to Catasauqua. One line ran to Northampton, while another passed the Hotel Arlington and crossed the Hockendaqua Bridge. By the 1890s, Catasauqua had more millionaires than any other town its size in the country. In the neighborhood between Bridge and Walnut, and from Second to Howard Town, they built their mansions, which cost over $20,000 in pre-1900 dollars to build. Some are gone, but many still remain. At the southwest corner of Bridge and Howard Town, James W. Fuller built this large house, now the site of St. Paul's Parsonage. His mother's home was opposite on Bridge Street. 
while Owen Fotzinger, president of the First National Bank, built this house at 4th and Bridge in 1903. Next door on 4th Street is the Tudor-style mansion of David Emanuel. These houses all still stand on 4th Street between Pine and Bridge. G.D. Derry's house is on the left in this picture of 5th Street where it begins at Howard Town. When his fortunes from silk were riding high, he incorporated the original house into one of the largest homes ever built in the Lehigh Valley. Diagonally across Pine is this house, while the Seaman House is across Pine with the spires of the Welsh and Presbyterian churches visible down Pine Street. This house, now gone, stood on Bridge Street next to the Presbyterian Church. But this house remains on 3rd Street above Bridge. And this view of the north side of Pine Street below 3rd is much the same today. Edwin Thomas enclosed the walls of his grandfather David's house into the stone mansion at 2nd and Pine. Diagonally across the street was this house, which was torn down to make room for the gardens of the Holton Home. Leonard Peckett lived here at 3rd and Walnut. The house in the foreground which stood at 2nd and Walnut is gone now. But Costin Bader's house with the white pillars stands on Front Street, and the yard and home of Clay Hammersley at Front and Union can still be seen. W.A. Borger's house on Front Street is now an apartment building and remains next to the American Hotel. A.F. Kuhn sold insurance from his home at Front and Mulberry. Catasauqua entered the 20th century strong, proud, and prosperous, though probably a bit sooty. The iron business was still the source of her wealth. The crane continued to produce iron, having in 1893 become part of the Empire Steel and Iron Company. From records of the empire preserved at the Canal Museum in Easton, we get a fascinating look at what some Catasauqua men were being paid in 1910. An engineer on the Crane Railroad got $2.53 a day, an Ironton Railroad engineer got $3.50, and a Catasauqua and Fogelsbilt train driver $4. Other Crane Railroad men were paid about $2 a day. Workers in the iron mills got rather less. A furnace keeper was paid about $2.40 for a day's work, probably a 12-hour shift, while a common laborer netted only $1.37. Even though it seems a pittance today, a Brinks spy retained by Leonard Packett found that the crane's workers were content enough to ignore the strikes which paralyzed the iron and steel industry in the rest of the country that year. Ashes and slag from the iron mill were dumped between the canal and the river. Eventually, a new dump was started north of the Catasauqua Woods, an area many residents remember as the Cinder Tip. This tunnel under 2nd and Howard Town connected the crane with the Cinder Tip. This is the western end of the tunnel, under 2nd Street, and this the eastern end, near American and Wood. In 1904, the bank moved to the very location David Thomas had proposed to donate a, year, a half a century before. With the Empire offices and the post office, this made the block of Bridge Street between Front and Second the commercial hub of town. The Lehigh Bank was chartered in 1903. Within its secure confines, Vital's jewelry store offered watches and glasses as well. Their clock sign became a landmark on Front Street. Up Bridge Street, the Catasauqua Dispatch was turned out weekly from this building which still stands. This entire half block of Bridge Street between Railroad and Second also survives. On Front Street stood the Mechanics Hall, which once contained the 5 and 10 and Hersh's hardware, and which now houses the Moose Home and the State Store. Also, Max Rice's store for gentlemen's clothing stood on Front Street, while a large planing mill, Goldsmith's, began in 1907 on Race Street above 14th. Catasauqua was studded with stores. Trine stood at Front Street above Mulberry. They seem to specialize in a little bit of everything. Bretzler's was a familiar sight on 2nd Street below Wood for many years. 
Finley's was apparently by the Hockendockle Bridge. Stanley Mann sold meat, including Scrapple for 10 cents a pound, on Front Street. And Ostheimer's shoe shop was also on Front Street. Many townsmen kept a personal shaving mug at Smith's on Front between Mulberry and Willow. North Catasauquins could satisfy their sweet tooth at Smith and Younger's, an ice cream parlor on 3rd Street near Arch. They made their own ice cream in a building on Limestone Street. Moving pictures came to Catasauqua in 1910 at Front and Pine, while dancing was another diversion. Optimism must have filled the air in Catasauqua as much as the smoke from her industry did. In 1914, Catasauqua threw herself a party, a week-long celebration of past and present known as Old Home Week. From June 28th to the 4th of July, the town commemorated the founding 75 years before of the Crane and the wealth it brought with speeches, banners, and parades. For a week, the whole town wore red, white, and blue and threw open its doors to all comers. there were parades. School children, firemen, veterans, dignitaries, workers, they all took to the street to proclaim the glory of America's richest town, the Iron Borough, Catasauqua. To commemorate their celebration, our ancestors left us a precious gift, a 400-page history book. Few towns have so permanent or detailed a printed record as Catasauqua. Little did the town, bursting with pride at its wealth and accomplishments, know that the end of both peace and prosperity was less than a decade away. rumblings actually occurred during Old Home Week, when the Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife were assassinated in Serbia. By August, Europe was engulfed in a terrible war, which two years later eventually reached across the Atlantic to America and to Catasauqua. The town's response was swift and typical. Dozens of young men enlisted, and in 1917, a million dollars in Liberty Bonds was raised in a short time, earning Catasauqua the nickname the Million Dollar Town. Parades, like this one, showed Catasauqua was squarely behind her boys who went off to serve and some to die in the cause of freedom. Catasauqua saluted those who returned, but these veterans came home not to a boom town, but one whose future was bleak. The crane continued operations for a few more years, but the anthracite iron industry was in its dying days. And for Catasauqua, the roar of the 20s was a bit hollow. Nevertheless, Kleppingers offered the latest electric appliances from their store on Front Street. And washing machines came to town. Cars lined Front Street. Hutzkos kept everyone looking their best. And the Majestic still presented the stars of the silver screen. Boys continued to play baseball, and Scherer and Burkholder still buried people. But the anthracite iron industry was outclassed by steel and unable to meet the demands of a huge industrialized country. In 1930, the crane fell silent, and Catasauqua's golden iron age was over. The Eagle Hotel stood until the 1930s, and the Pennsylvania until the 40s. Meanwhile, the Eagle Brewery continued to turn out good beer. The playgrounds was designed by the Works Project Administration during the Depression to hold the pool, still among the largest in Lehigh County. 